Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Episode of On Finding Peace. This is a podcast where we talk about practical ways of helping all of us to find an inner peace and to guide us toward finding an inner peace in our daily lives. And I'm very uh, pleased to have a guest with us today. And uh, our guest today is Catherine McConnell, who is a uh, counselor, and she'll tell us a bit about herself. But um, one of the things that she has done for uh, us is to write a blog post, which is over on my website, which is lifesjourneyblog.com. And we're going to talk a bit about what she posted and get some more insights uh, from her. And the topic is on humanizing addiction counseling. Um, she also specializes in trauma, so I'm sure we're going to touch upon that topic as well. So uh, thanks, Catherine, for being with us. Sure. Uh, so if you can uh, tell the audience a, a bit about yourself and where you are and what you do. Yeah, I am a licensed counselor in the state of Texas. I'm in the DFW area. I'm also what's called a certified field traumatologist, um, meaning I've studied trauma. Um, they can send me out to like disasters and stuff like that. My my sort of focus is trauma, but in dealing with trauma, addiction is so co-occurring that I've I've ended up treating quite a bit of that. Um, I focus mainly on post-traumatic stress disorder and associated anxiety disorders, and I see civilians as well, but my area of interest is mostly first responders and soldiers. Wonderful. So that must give you a, a breadth of uh, different experiences by either going out in the field or dealing with the first responders that they see so much uh, tragedy in, in basically their everyday lives. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and, and it's funny the way I got into addiction counseling. My agency job, um, sometimes counselors when we're building our practices will, as you know, work at an agency as well as building, and my agency job is CPS cases, and so I see a lot of trauma and a lot of co-occurring addiction. Um, so when I see addiction, I, I almost always see compound trauma coupled with it. Yeah, you know... Uh... That's one thing that I found. I, I've, um, I'm also a, uh, amongst other things, a, a certified addiction counselor. I've been doing it for uh, a bit over 20 years, uh, mainly uh, inner city Baltimore. And over the years, I, I've kind of seen the addiction field becoming more and more aware of that trauma connection. You know, I, I think when I first started back in uh, the early 90s or so, uh, there didn't seem to be that connection. You know, it, it was more focused on the the behavior and, and getting the person off of what they were doing, where now I, I've kind of seen that switch, you know, where we start to say, well, what are some of the underlying, uh, you know, issues and how do we work on those? Yeah, I've noticed sort of two schools of thought. So there are those who, um, what most addicts I think will be familiar with, and the ones that come into me are scared to death by the time they get to me that they've been judged and told that they're awful. And my God, why can't you just quit the drug? And they've been beaten to death with four of you. Um, I don't really focus on any of that. And I, I've noticed some of my coworkers that are of like minds I, we see the addiction as a symptom instead of as the problem. And I think when you do it that way, like you said, we can humanize a lot more. And this is a human being in pain that is coping the best way they can instead of, man, you're a loser drug addict, you know. And I think there's a lot more success when you go at it that way. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. One of the things when I was first in the field, and, and it felt so uncomfortable to me, but you know, I, I was being trained by people who'd been doing this, you know, for ages. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I trusted them and I, they all meant well, I'm sure. But one of the things that I was constantly told was, um, you know, really stay on the addict and break them down. 
because yeah. until you can break them down, you can't build them up. That that seemed to bother me. Yeah, I think it very much goes against our instincts as therapists. You know, our our job is not to tear people down, maybe defenses, um, but not the actual person. And and I do see that a lot when my addicts relapse, they are terrified to tell me. And I just tell them, you know, it's part of the process and it's information that we need and we'll get through it. It it's it just kind of goes with the territory, not to minimize, but you know, I think when we have this place where you are not the addiction. You know, I think people used to be coupled with their addiction seen as one and the same. You're a person with a problem instead of you are the addiction, I think is sort of, we're starting to differentiate the two. Yeah. And can you speak a bit more on that? You know, because that I, I, I've seen it as the key that the more we're getting into, uh, I think, an, an acceptance of addiction as a disease that concept that you just mentioned, I, I think, is becoming truer and truer. Although I still don't hear, uh, you know, too many counselors talking about it. How do you see that as an important difference? Well, it is. It's really easy to be awfully, awfully hard on addicts when you see them as their addiction, when they are their diagnosis, you know, and I talk to people of all different diagnoses that this is a diagnosis, but it doesn't determine who you are. Um, For example, when they go to drug meetings, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm an addict. Well, yeah, but there's a lot more to you. And if we can bring out the pieces of you that aren't your addiction, Maybe we can build some coping skills and some support systems. And, you know, I think when we differentiate them from the addiction, they start to do the same. Um, Life is sort of a different flavor when you're just a loser heroin addict. But if you are someone who has been really hurt, who is coping with heroin, it's a totally different mindset. Um, And it can really prevent a lot of the uh, self-worth issues from getting worse. I mean, Many of them, when they start their addiction, already have self-worth issues, and then they have their families identifying them as a heroin addict instead of my youngest daughter, and it just gets worse from there, and they can't untangle themselves from the addiction that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think – sorry. I think we need to sort of lead the way in – uncoupling those two things. If we talk to them as if they are a person with an addiction instead of as them being an addict, as them being being their addiction, it's a little bit different. And I've often wondered, and, and you could probably speak to this better than I with your trauma background, that the more we encourage them to identify as the addict or the alcoholic, are we in some way re-traumatizing? Absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, when someone is traumatized, depending on the type of trauma, um, they are depersonalized. Um, sexual abuse. I see a lot of sexual abuse with addiction, and the whole deal with sexual abuse is you're an object. You're not a person. Mm-hmm. And when we continue that train of thought and continue down that path, they can't differentiate and they continue to sort of re-experience. Right. I mean, I I understand and and I'm really big into what the 12 steps stand for and Mm -hmm. the wonderful successes that those meetings have done. On the one level, I can understand when a person can stand up and give their name and say they're an alcoholic or an addict. But at the other hand, I don't know of many other support type groups or just in normal settings where somebody will introduce themselves by their name and say, I'm cancer or so right. similar. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that even though I get it, it, it still somewhat boggles my mind that we're, we're encouraging somebody to identify themselves with either an action they've done or a disease that they have versus identifying who they may be. Right. And and that's an older model. And it, it is somewhat successful. Some people, it doesn't work for them. But I mean, we don't have a lot of alternative models. I think um, the field of addiction is actually pretty young in the grand scheme of things. And um, we learn more every day. We don't know a lot about physiology. And because it's also a physiologic 
issue. I think it's going to continue to grow, but I, I think you're right that maybe we need an alternative model from that, or at least to tweak it a little bit. It might be time for a, a makeover. Yeah, of some sorts, you know, taking what's working and what's right. not working and, you know, maybe improve upon. And, you know, one of the things you had uh, just previously mentioned about the whole relapse process, um, maybe about 10 years or so in, into my uh, experience and career with, with working with people with addictions, I, I got into uh, some specialized training with relapse, you know, prevention. And mm -hmm. that's about the first time that I was able to, I, I guess, allow myself might be the, the phrase to accept the fact that maybe relapse is a part of the recovery process. Yeah. Where I was always taught that, it's not a part of, and it's somewhat of a failure, but working with it, it became more so that maybe it is a part, maybe there, there's actually a purpose for it. Right. Well, I think addiction, like anything else, is a defense mechanism. It's just external dissociation instead of doing it mentally. And, you know, anytime someone has a dissociative problem, if they have a stressful moment and they dissociate, we don't criminalize them for that. We say, oh, well, we still have some work to do. We need to build some coping mechanisms. You're still going back to old patterns. And I feel like we need to do the same thing with addiction rather than villainizing them and, and you know, encouraging depression, which then encourages more addiction. We need to, again, separate them from the addiction and say, okay, this is information that you're still suffering, that your coping mechanisms aren't working. You know, we'll, we'll go from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... I, I guess for the purpose of, of this podcast, I don't want to go deeply into, you know, do we legalize it or anything right. like that, um, except to say that, uh, again, if we focus back to the trauma, you know, what are we doing to somebody who maybe had some sort of childhood trauma of whatever type, who then gets picked up for the drug use and is now thrown into, you know, the, the incarceration system? Right. Um, not only could we be re-traumatizing, but are we creating new traumas? Absolutely. I see it all the time. I have some people who already had post-traumatic stress and then got compound post-traumatic stress from being incarcerated because it was so stressful for them. And then there's the whole, you know, there's a lot of issues that we, we won't go into here. But again, you know, the war on drugs versus truly violent behavior. I mean, it's it's sort of this big Gordian knot that needs to be untangled. Did you have any... And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will. Um, <laughs> any thoughts or insight into why addiction still is not perceived as the medical condition that it is? And the context being, you know, one of the things that when people would kind of try to confront me on this and say, well, that's just this new age, you know, way of thinking. But mm -hmm. actually back in 1957, you know, it, it was declared by, you know, the American Medical Association as a disease, you know, unlike any other disease. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, something we came up with five years ago. I mean, this is 1957 we're talking about. Right. But we're still not there. And, and even people in the profession, you know, um, are like amazed, like, oh, did they said that way back then? <laughs> Where do you think the disconnect might be? I think part of it is in our lack of vocabulary. We just don't have the word, you know, when you think of a disease, you think of something that you catch, like the flu. Um, it's not like somebody sneezes on you and you catch addiction. And I think that's part of where the disconnect is. But I think um, it's not just an addiction. I think more generally, we are finding more and more that our mental issues are physiologic in nature. Um, I see this a lot with trauma and I have to explain to people that post-traumatic stress is actually a physical issue. There's all kinds of stress hormones and um, body memory and, and all kinds of stuff. And again, that goes for the addicts too. And I think we're thinking of the term disease a little too narrowly in that respect. If we think of it just as something that is physiologic in nature, absolutely. But if you think of it as something that you can go to a hospital and catch from another patient, no. So it may just be in different definitions of the word. So if we begin to change our perspective on the way we view disease, right. we might come to a, a deeper understanding of addiction as disease. 
Mm-hmm. I think so. So you've just taken a complicated system and made it more complicated. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> now we have to rethink the scenes. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I'm somewhat messing, you know, with, with the definition, but I, I totally right. agree, you know, that it's, uh, you know, it, addiction is definitely a disease and it is something that needs to be treated as such, but all too often from professionals to paraprofessionals to, uh, you know, family members aren't looking at it, you know, from that way. And, yeah. Uh, and I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. I think it has a little bit of a different flavor because people see it as a choice and it is, but it isn't. Again, it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, You choose to put the needle in your arm. You choose to smoke. You don't choose to catch cancer. And so I think that's also one part um, that sort of confuses people is they're like, well, this is a choice. Eh, Maybe it started that way. But if, at some point, it's not. And then, you know, we also go into um, hereditary predispositions, which you have with physiologic disease. So why is this any different? Yeah. And, you know, for people who may not know that, there there is scientific evidence of genetic predisposition to various addictions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that's scientific proven. It's not just us thinking this. Right. Um yeah, it's to me it, it's somewhat reminiscent, and, and I got this when I was working in inpatient facilities when uh, we would call some insurance companies, and you know that they would say to us, you know, well, have they fi- had a failed outpatient, uh, you know, time before coming into inpatient? Yeah, and it, it always confused me because I, I'm thinking, so you want them an outpatient where they're going to fail before I can get reimbursed for them in inpatient. Like where right. else in medical, you know, does this work? And even with the relapse, you know, you, you'd really have to fight the, the insurance for reimbursement for the relapse. Cause again, it came almost down to, well, their choice, you know, they, they've used their benefit. And, and I, I kind of liken it to heart disease, you know, where if you have the heart attack and you're in the hospital and the doctor says to you, well, here's the following things that you need to avoid, and here's the things you need to do different in your life to maintain heart health. And for the person who doesn't do those things, gets another heart attack, shows up in the hospital, how many of them are either refused treatment or made to feel less than? Right. But wasn't that their choice not to change their lifestyle as directed? Just like if somebody left my facility and, and I would direct them on some recovery and aftercare work, if they chose not to and they relapse, and well, what's the difference? Yeah, um, I, I think some of that depends on the physician because I have seen physicians get really frustrated, but it's not the same flavor. It's not, there's no disdain there the way there is with addiction. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. the flavor is a little different. There's this very much sort of looking down your nose at addicts. Um, and I find that interesting because we have everyday addictions. Coffee, alcohol is one of the more detrimental, very, very legal ways of coping. I see exercise zealots. I mean, if you really want to get to the core of it, everybody has something. So why is it any different when someone is really struggling to cope? with an illicit substance. I find that kind of hard that people can't identify. I feel like they're not trying hard enough. Yeah, no, definitely. And I kind of chuckle because as you say that I'm drinking coffee um, (laughs) so that I don't feel ill later in the day, which is something I hear from, you know, many, uh, many person with addiction. Um, it, it really is that shift in, in the mindset, and, and that's one of the, you know, reasons that, you know, I really wanted you on, on this podcast, because I, I think it's important for us to shift this perspective, and, you know, I, I know in the blog post that you wrote for my website, uh, you know, you, you talk about that this need to humanize. Um, what, what do you, maybe a little more concretely, but what, what do you mean by humanizing, you know, how we treat people with addiction? Yeah. So 
So I am not an addiction specialist. I didn't have a ton of interest in it. I've just really stumbled on it. You can't treat trauma and not see addiction. Mm-hmm. And the more I worked with it, the more I realized these are just really, really injured people that are struggling to cope. Many of them are lower socioeconomic status. So in their world, this is normal. This is how you cope, right? You have fist fights and you smoke a joint and you feel better. And so part of it is is social and part of it is that it is normative in their culture. And then part of it, most of it, the way I see it is these are people in pain and I'm not going to do anybody any good by villainizing them for being in pain and not having the skills to cope with that. So I feel like it's our responsibility to kind of take them off the defensive. I mean, I I noticed, um, like I said, I work with CPS cases and they'll come in ready to fight because they're so used to, you know, you're being terrible for your kids and you just aren't trying hard enough and blah, blah, blah. And I just say, tell me what hurts. You know, I don't talk about how you lose all your teeth with meth. Most of them can teach me more than I can tell them about the science behind the drugs. They knew that when they picked it up. This Mm. is somebody who is running from pain. And until we treat it like that, we're going to continue to have problems. Right. It, it, because the way it was explained to me way back when, you know, what was that they've become so entrenched in, in their defense mechanisms that if you don't get in their face and, and don't treat them, you know, in, in that way of trying to break them, uh, they'll just continue to use their defenses, lie to you, and get around you. Um, uh, are you saying that's not true in that sense, or is there a way to not have them kind of lie and get around you while still treating them like a human? Yeah, well, um, it's very true, but it's still information. If you're lying to me and I find out you're lying to me, there was a reason for that. So what was the reasoning behind it? That's that's really what we get to. I absolutely expect them to lie to me. And I tell them, if you lie to me, I can't help you. And And honestly, most of them generally don't. They just come in and they say, man, I... I couldn't hack it this weekend and I relapsed. And the the thing that I'm struck with is I'm always told, well, you didn't judge me. Mm. That's, that's, it, it's interesting because when you come directly at them head first, they're so used to that. That's when their defenses go up. If you treat them like a human being, they don't know what to do with that. And that's usually when they break down and the walls come down because somebody's finally listening rather than just accusing um, and pointing the finger. Right. And and that's one of the, you know, techniques that I've found, not just in addiction, because, you know, right now in my practice, uh, I do the yeah. gamut of, uh, you know, issues uh, that people are having in life. But that's one of the things that I find that if if you don't respond in the way that they expect you to respond, they're so confused or unnerved or, you know, <laughs> yes. off point, that, yeah, you're, you're going to get the, the true them in, in that sense. They just don't know what to do because they've either been through it before, they already rehearsed in their mind <laughs> how they're going to do this, and, and now it's like, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to do. Right. They're so primed to fight that when you just refuse to engage – they don't know what to do. And it's, it's interesting. It's a really interesting process because again, these people come from trauma and mistrust comes from trauma. So then you get the whole, well, why are you being nice to me? What's, what's your goal here? So it's kind of funny to watch. So it's a kind of a, a double-edged issue in, in the sense that it, it brings some of the defenses down, but are they now getting a little more maybe suspicious that can I trust this person because I don't know what they're up to. Yeah, but I honestly feel like that's a good thing. I feel like it's modeling good boundaries. It's not actually a good thing to go up to a stranger and emotionally vomit everything. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's part of practicing good boundaries and teaching them testing behavior. Can I trust this person? 
Um, and, and I tell them, you know, you shouldn't trust me today. You don't know me. We'll develop a relationship over time and we can work through what we need to work through. I don't expect you to tell me everything today. I, I, I really like that approach, you know, to tell them right from the beginning, you know, I don't expect you to trust me. And um, because that is a, a good boundary, you know, I mean, we, we've been taught that, you know, don't just trust a stranger because, you know, they say they're trustworthy. You know, you, you kind of need to right. learn that trustworthiness. So I, I guess if they see the genuineness in you, they can begin to understand that you're not out to use them to get one over on them. You're just trying to help them. Yeah. And, and you have to remember that with addiction comes the world of addiction and it's people that use you and abuse you and manipulate. And so part of it is showing them, if nothing else, what a healthy relationship looks like. And then they learn how to feel their way through that and reset their radar as far as I can trust this person. I can't trust this person because, you know, with your drug dealer, you're going to do what you need to do to get your fix and you don't necessarily trust them, but you allow them to manipulate you. So it's, it's partly reteaching social behaviors and, and sometimes it's not even reteaching. It's just teaching. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of people who are addicted who come from the ghetto that never learned healthy behaviors. So it's an important piece of the puzzle. And, and, that is very true because one of the things that I was uh, always taught was you want to model the behavior that you're expecting, you know, from your client. So in that modeling of what is a healthy relationship, what are healthy boundaries, you're really helping to move them beyond the trauma and beyond uh, that uh, addictive way of living to have them see there is a different way to do that. And I would tend to think that that's pretty powerful in and of itself. Yeah, I would think so. And and figuring out that you can get your needs met from another person without having to manipulate them to get that, I think is really important because the whole game of addiction is manipulation in one way or another. And if mm -hmm. we can teach them how to get their needs met healthily, and then also deal with the trauma. They don't need the drug anymore. And, and that's where I think becomes that key for the, the humanizing piece, because the more we can either break them down or tell them they're doing something harmful to themselves, which they already know. I, I, right. I've yet to meet an addict that doesn't know they're harming themselves. Um, you know, when when you kind of make it so that you're removing that need because you're filling whatever they were trying to suppress by the drugs or the alcohol. You're filling that with whatever is healthy for them to cope with. It, it no longer becomes the question of, you know, are you going to use or not use in the sense of, well, there's no need to use. Right. Um, if you can think of it, and this is sort of an odd parallel, pica syndrome, where people mm -hmm. will eat chalk or glass or dirt because of a nutrient deficiency, um, is also an addiction, but it's considered a medical phenomenon. And it's sort of like that in that they're trying to get a need met, whether it's dopamine, serotonin, you know, we talk about chasing that high, that's on neurotransmitters. And if we can teach them um, that avoidance ultimately is not the way to go. And not only that, you know, most of these people have burned out, burned all their bridges. They don't have allies anymore. So telling them I'm your ally, I'm going to walk through this with you and, and being honest, this is going to hurt, but it's not going to hurt as bad as you think it is. And right. walking them through that and then they clear out whatever was going on, develop healthy mechanisms and they don't have to avoid. This is all about avoidance. So once we walk them through that, they heal. And again, the need is filled through something healthy and they don't need the drug anymore. Right. Yeah, it, it's that whole thing that I, I've kind of learned through the years of if you remove something from someone's life, you need to replace what you've removed. You can't just right. put a void. So if we were to remove the drug and the alcohol from their life, what are we putting in its place? 
So, yes. you know, I, I think in this way, if, if we're not just removing that, but we're filling that void, we're filling those trauma areas, then yeah, there, there isn't that need to bring anything back. You know, we, we've already filled that. Right. What might be some practical things that family members might be able to work on to cope with this? Um, because I, I would tend to think that the more family members are dealing with somebody in the family that is suffering from addiction, and especially if they are, are relapsing, is that in some way traumatizing the family? Oh, absolutely. It it causes a rift in trust. Um, they really begin to not see this person as, you know, my sister or whatever. They see them as this heroin addict. They They know if you talk to family members, they know this is not my sister. This is the drug. But they don't know how to go about it. And some of them accidentally enable, you know, addicts almost always come from faulty family systems and not necessarily in the way that you think. You know, I've seen, um, again, we think about people in the ghetto get addicted to drugs, right? But upper class people do too, and they have their own family dysfunction. And um, in family systems, there's always what we in the field call an identified patient. And the addict is actually the voice of the family, but nobody knows that. So if you can figure out what's underneath the addiction and address that, I mean, that's going to help the entire family. Um, you know, almost always when we see full-blown addiction, someone is enabling somewhere. And we hear a lot, well, you have to let them hit rock bottom. I don't believe that. But you you do definitely need to make an effort to not enable. But I think – you know, it's so personal and your heart is involved when it's a family member and their defenses get in the way. They start to depersonalize. Well, that's the heroin talking. You're nothing but a heroin addict. And they really need to listen. And I, I see a lot of times invalidating um, because their defenses get in the way. Well, mom, you were always working. You were never home. Well, no, that's not how it was. You're, you're remembering it wrong. Just listen. Whether you right. think they're right or not, hear them. I think that's even probably the most powerful thing you can do. Even what? Even if it's going to be painful for you to hear what they're telling you. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. healing is painful. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that honesty, you know, not, not you know, so many times I hear counselors try to sugarcoat things and, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's so much more important to have that, uh, you know, honesty out there that, yes, I'm not going to eliminate all of your pain and maybe some of the things we're going to do is actually going to increase your pain, but here's what we're going to do to cope with all that pain. Yeah, I think it's really powerful. Um, there was a study done a few years ago that about visit four, four or five people would drop out of therapy. And and that's, you know, the first couple, we do a history and a treatment plan, and then we start really working around visit four or five, and people go, oh, I can't handle this. So I'm very upfront, and I tell them, this is, it's not going to be comfortable, but discomfort is information. So if it gets to be too much, let me know. It means we need to build some coping mechanisms, you know, just check in with me with your symptoms. And I also tell them symptoms might get worse before they get better, and that's expected. And when I think when you tell them that, they don't panic when it happens because mm -hmm. people by their very nature, oh, I'm getting worse. This isn't working. I need to stop this. It's making it worse. And if you tell them to expect that, they don't freak out so much. Right. So, so giving the information is quite powerful to helping somebody in, in coping with what they're going through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, kind of normalizes it. Mm -hmm. I've in in looking over uh, your website um, with, with great information and all. I, I've uh, found an interesting tab and thought you might uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, don't you? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I just so, added some, so. Ah, okay. So uh, 
Can you uh, help to identify and introduce us to Kisa? Oh, yeah. Kisa is my therapy dog. She is a four-year-old golden doodle, um, which is a mix between a golden retriever and a poodle, and she is fantastic. So I, I love her because people just identify with an animal a lot better than they do a person, particularly if people have been what's traumatized them. So she's a really useful tool. Um, her sensing is great. Like for example, if I have a group, she will go to the person that's hurting the most. So she is another avenue to get information. Um, but she's also a really good tool. She kind of brings the seriousness of it all down. You know, everybody calms down when there's a dog in the room. So yeah, she's really useful. And she's uh, certified as a therapy dog. What what does that mean? Yes. Um, essentially, it's a really well trained dog. So when you have a therapy dog, um, they first of all get them as puppies and assess temperament. Um, for example, she has a sister who is is not a good therapy dog. She's got too much of the hunting instinct, um, so she'll run off and chase a squirrel. But Kisa is pretty good about. She's pretty relaxed and pretty good about not doing that. So they're assessed for temperament. Um, they're assessed for aggression so that they don't get aggressive. Um, I've only had her do that once and she was protecting me. So she's not going to flip out on someone. Um, they are taught different commands. Really, They're essentially a really well-trained dog, but they also have other commands. For example, I have one called Leave It. Um, so if we're in a hospital and somebody drops some medication, I can say leave it and she'll leave it alone. She won't eat it. So that's sort of a safety yep. one. So they're they're just a little more tailored towards um, doing what we do. And therapy dogs are used in so much. Lots of animals, equine assisted therapy. It's really an interesting avenue. Yeah, most definitely. And, and that's why I wanted to bring that up because uh, it, it's at least for me and, you know, maybe just I, I haven't researched it enough, but where <laughs> the people are doing that, you know, the you, you have Keith in, in your practice. But uh, mm -hmm. I do know of, of all the studies that show, you know, how great animals can be in helping that therapeutic process. And yes. I know for myself as a dog person, you know, just personally how great it is to have the dog around. Uh, yeah. So to, to see that you can incorporate you know, that in, into your practice. I just had to bring that up. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, she looks so cute. There's a picture of her on the website. Um, yeah, m most of uh, the dogs I've had have been uh, golden retrievers. So to, mm -hmm. to see yeah, that, they're a good uh, breed for mix. This. Yeah, I can kind of see it in her face, the golden retriever uh, part mm -hmm. of her. That's excellent. Um, is, is there anything that you think we haven't covered that, that you think is important to uh, be said? Um, probably my biggest thing that I would say is that addiction is a family disease. I don't know if we touched on that. I think we did a little bit, but little, but not if you are, yeah, if you're a family member of an addict, get yourself some support too. And then I would just plead to the providers to be compassionate because these people need that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, I've worked in, in facilities that have uh, family programs and those that don't, you can see dramatically the difference in, yes. you know, how the uh, clients fare and, and even how they are during the treatment process, you know, whether they know family will be a part of that process or, or not. So yeah, uh, I, I definitely, you know, second what, what you just said. It's, it's so vitally important. Excellent. If people want to know more about you or uh, get in touch with you for your uh, private practice in, in Texas, what is the best way that they can get a hold of you? You can reach me online at www.catherinem, as in Mike, counseling.com. Um, my number is 817-757-3728. And I actually have an upcoming podcast that's going to be all trauma-focused too. Um, so look out for that. And um, I would tell them, even if they're not in my area, 
I have a whole network. So if you are comfortable and you want to reach out to me, go ahead. Excellent. Yep. And I would encourage people to do that. Um, again, that's KatherineMCounseling.com. And uh, do you have a opening date for your podcast as of yet and where people might be able to find that? Or should we just keep looking at your website? Well, I have a blog talk radio page. It's blogtalkradio.com slash headspace. Um, right now I am taping the first 10 to 12 ex- episodes. I want to release them in a batch. So maybe a month. Okay. I'm hoping optimistically. Great. And so there on that part of the website, you'll start posting when those get out yes. so people can start subscribing. Yes. Excellent. Definitely looking forward to that because, you know, so many people are, are suffering from traumas and uh, right. you know, it's good to hear, um, you know, I, I think not only in those coping skills, but to understand, you know, if you're suffering from the traumas, you, you're not doing it alone. Right. Excellent. Well, I do appreciate uh, the time for coming on uh, my podcast and, mm-hmm. you know, for sharing uh, what you did. It's it's you know, been excellent. And, you know, I, I know for myself, um, you know, it's a breath of fresh air to, to hear people talking about uh, humanizing how we approach addiction treatment. Yeah, I agree. I think it's important. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.